I'm Chad Main, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about innovation and the impact of technology in the legal industry. Today's episode, we talk to data privacy attorney Christian Audi about data privacy laws and how companies can legally transfer data between the European Union and the United States. Christian Audi is today's guest, and he's a repeat offender of the Technically Legal podcast. He's a good buddy of mine, and he's a data privacy attorney that practices with the law firm of Brian Cave. I asked Christian to come back on the show to talk about a recent legal opinion from the European Court of Justice that's affectionately referred to in the legal and data privacy community as SHREMS 2. The European Union has a few laws prohibiting the transfer of certain data over to the United States unless it's adequately protected. That was what was at issue in SHREMS 2. We're obviously going to get in a lot more detail about the opinion, but in a nutshell, SHREMS invalidated certain types of data transfers between the EU and the U.S., because the EU court didn't believe that laws in the United States adequately protected the privacy of people's data. Specifically, the SHREMS 2 decision invalidated something called the Privacy Shield Framework. This is a certification program created by the U.S. and European governments that permitted companies to transfer data between the EU and the U.S. if the companies became certified under the program. To be certified under the Privacy Shield Framework, companies had to do things like have a privacy policy that granted customers certain rights to access their data, The privacy policies also had to have dispute resolution mechanisms if there were issues over that data. And also, the companies also had to ensure that they were observing certain levels of data security measures. Full disclosure, I was personally motivated to get Christian back on the podcast to talk about SHREMS 2. Some of the customers at my company, Percipient, have offices in the EU. After the SHREMS 2 opinion came down, I wanted to make sure that we had all our ducks in a row and all our contracts with our customers were still good. So I hopped on the internet to do a little research and I couldn't really find any practical advice. I found a lot of theoretical discussions and a lot of pontification, but no real helpful tips. So that's something I wanted to try to solve today by getting Christian on the podcast. So you are, to technically legal podcast, what Alec Baldwin is to SNL. You are officially on the most times. Wow. Third time. Third I time. do not know what to say. Yeah. Was it, 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 I can't believe that Alec Baldwin... Has been on the most times for us. I looked. I think it's 17, and the next closest was the next closest was 14. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm. This is just three. I mean, it's going to take me a long time to get to 17, <laughs> brother. I mean, you know. I have a hunch that technically legal podcast will not be here 17. I think it'll week. be here. I think it's it's going to go down in the annals. I'm going to be like, you're going to. This is going to be like the the early years, the 70- right? This is like the early Joe Rogan right now. <laughs> like a 78 is. record. That's or something. right. That's right. The, the, That's right. A classic. The a classic. I'm going to be uh, the answer to a Jeopardy question. I wish it was like Joe Rogan. Yeah. I'd take a million, hundred million bucks. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, let's do that. Uh, the last time, though, you were here, you were at a different law firm. Where are you I now? I was. I am at Brian K. Vlayton and Paysner. The counsel there in the Chicago office focused entirely on data privacy. So it's compliance almost exclusively. So I say it's using it, not losing it. I, I help coach clients in dealing with challenges associated with their data on a daily basis. Speaking of which, talk about Schrems 2. So tell yes. me if I'm right about this. Schrems 2 is a, was a case, for lack of a better word. Yeah, over there? judgment, yeah. Case, judgment, yep. Filed by Maximilian Schrems, mm-hmm. who at one point was a law student at Santa Clara, and he's an Austrian citizen, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's right, yeah. After hearing someone from Facebook come to speak one of his law school classes, and determining that, in his opinion, at least, Facebook in general didn't understand European privacy law enough. Ultimately, he filed some legal actions in the EU against Facebook about the transfer of his private information from over in the EU to America. That's right. So there's been a few. There's Trems 1. There's been some other stuff. And I want That's to get right. into the history of all this. But in a nutshell, what happened to this Schrems 2 case that came down last month, July 2020? So in a nutshell, what Schrems 2 says and what the, what the European Court of Justice said is that one of the mechanisms for getting data from the EU to specifically the United States, that mechanism being privacy shield, is invalid, effective immediately. That was the big headline from Schrems 2. And the reason that it was invalidated was because essentially the United States buy-in through this program, Privacy Shield, was not providing a sufficient level of protection to the data of European data subjects. But it wasn't within the Privacy Shield itself. It was in because of some other stuff going on in America, namely cooperation with the NSA and giving the NSA access to American 
data, right? Yeah, that was the big problem, right? Is, is they said that the fact of that, basically in the ombudsman that's appointed under Privacy Shield did not have sufficient power, was not able to effectively and meaningfully protect the data from, let's just say, like the intelligence apparatus of the United States. And because of that, the whole program had to be invalidated. And, you know, I should point out, too, the Schrems 2, this opinion came down last month, was handed down by the Court of Justice. Is it fair to say that the Court of Justice of the EU is equivalent of our Supreme Court? Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, you, there, this is the highest court in, in the EU, right? This is kind of the final word on that ish, on this issue. You know, it came to the court sort of the same way you, you can kind of, you can sometimes refer interlocutory questions in the United States Sometimes, for example, a district court, a federal district court will refer a question regarding state law to a state Supreme Court. That's, that can happen. I think it can happen. Right? Interlocutory meaning yeah. one court asks another court for an opinion. Interlocutory meaning it's happening in the middle of a proceeding, right? And, and so the court's saying, well, hey, you know, well, what about this? How do we deal with this? How do we deal with this issue? You know, please tell us under state law what this means, right? This was kind of the opposite of that, but the Irish High Court was hearing Schrem's complaint about the transfer specifically of data from Facebook Ireland. The reason it was in Ireland was because that's where Facebook's yeah, yeah. European HQ is. Yeah, and, and I should say I've got to be careful about getting into Facebook-specific issues. But Facebook Ireland, the transfer from Facebook Ireland of data to Facebook Inc. in the United States on a controller to processor level. That's what Schrems was challenging. And the Irish High Court referred up a number of questions to the uh, European Court of Justice among those, you know, was questions that implicated the validity of Privacy Shield. So, so let's unpack that. Yeah. So let's, un let's unpack that. Let's, let's back up before we get ahead of ourselves. So Privacy Shield came to be under the predecessor to the GDPR, the EU Data uh, Protection Directive. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So Privacy Shield was actually the second iteration of an agreement between the European Commission on the one hand and uh, our Department of Commerce. The first iteration of this was called Safe Harbor. And Safe Harbor was in effect until, oh gosh, you'll, help, you'll have to help me out on this one. It was in 2013, 2014. I think so, 2015. 2015, okay, yeah. I so, think. so Safe Harbor was in effect until, until around then, and Schrems actually made a name for himself by challenging that successfully. Safe Harbor was invalidated, right? And the, the successor sort of regime that was initially approved in 2016 was Privacy Shield. And Privacy Shield was a program under which you as an organization in the United States that was subject to FTC or DOT or Department of Transportation jurisdiction. If you're subject to FT FTC or DOT jurisdiction, you were able to self-certify that you were going to comply with this regime. And the regime being the Privacy Shield, it's at a high level, what is it? Like it's certain things like making sure that there's certain levels of security and making sure your contracts yeah. protect well, yeah, data. Yeah, basically, you're going to grant certain, you're agreeing to grant European data subjects certain rights that they would not ordinarily and immediately have, right? Regarding how their data is being processed, certain rights to object. You're going to make, make certain representations. You're going to make certain disclosures in your privacy policy, you know, et cetera. And you, you self-certified compliance with this program. You submitted certain language, including language in your privacy policy, to the U.S. government for approval. It's approved. You put it in your privacy policy. And you get on a list. You were on a roster. And there were over 5,000 companies on this roster. And you were then part of the Privacy Shield program. What that meant was that you could be essentially sent data from the EU without more. You were, as a company, sort of in a, a little mini adequate jurisdiction that could receive data from the EU. Okay, so that was invalidated by Schrems too. It was. But before that, you know, Privacy Shield stems from the Data Protection Directive. GDPR comes into play. Yes. It has similar, similar restrictions on the transfer of data about EU citizens to other countries, i.e. the United States. That's right. What, if anything, is the difference between the, the Data Protection Directive and the GDPR? Well, first, the, the main thing is enforcement, right? So a lot of these, as you say, a lot of these extraterritoriality principles are not new, okay? The standard contractual clauses, which we're going to talk about later, significantly predate GDPR. The main big difference between GDPR and, and the Privacy Directive is teeth. 
It's people paying attention to this stuff, people focusing on this stuff, because controllers were having to worry about fines in excess of, you know. And the controller, let's draw that distinction to the GDPR. Basically, there's two types of companies handling data. You have the controllers and the processors. What are the, what's the difference there? So a controller is, an, is the entity that is the boss of the data. They, in the parlance of GDPR, they determine the purposes and, purpose and means of processing. Okay? They, it's their data. They decide what to do with it. So it's the company collecting it. It's the company usually, but not always. Okay, not always. But usually it's the company collecting it from the data subject. And they owe, this is who GDPR primarily regulates, not exclusively, but primarily. So if you look at, you know, uh, all of the notice obligations that you find in articles, you know, 12, 13, 14, those are, controllers are supposed to be providing notice to data subjects about how they're going to treat data. And a data subject is a, a citizen of the EU. A data subject, a data subject is a person located in the EU, let's say. You don't necessarily have to be a citizen. Uh, but yeah, it's somebody in the EU, right? So the point is, is that a controller is the one who's collecting, usually collecting, not always, right? But it's, they're the ones that are, that are the boss of the data, okay? They're the ones that have to have, you know, provide notice. They're the ones that have to have a basis for processing. Remember under GDPR, you have to have a reason for having the data. You have to always be justifying yourself, right? You have to have, you know, consent of the data subject, or it has to be necessary for a contract, or you have a legitimate interest in processing it. Those are the three main ones that folks rely on in a typical business uh, situation. So th that's a controller, okay? Boss of the data, first one regulated under GDPR. Then there's this other entity that's called a processor. Processors, basically, I, I refer to it as like the soldier, right? The processor is the one who receives instructions from the controller about what to do. Let me give you a very basic example. Data backup, right? I, the business, is, I, I'm, I'm, I collect a bunch of data from data subjects. I say to them, you know, uh, here's my basis for processing. It's consent. It's legitimate interest. I provide them with a privacy policy. And then I say, oh, gee, you know, what do I do if I lose all of this? I better, I better have data backup, right? So I send that data to Amazon AWS. And Amazon is now my processor. I'm telling Amazon what to do. Specifically, I'm telling them, just sit on it, right? Just store the data for me in case I lose it. Keep it in a safe spot. I'll let you know when I need it back. I'll let you know what to do with it. That is a classic example of a processor. So my company, sometimes is a processor. For instance, I'll give an example. We help with compliance issues and for companies that have offices overseas. They give us information. We need to sift through it, look at it, help them find stuff. We're processing that data. This is exactly what I brought you on, on the podcast because after Shrems 2 came down, you know, so we talked to some of our customers. They're like, well, what does this mean? Are our contracts okay? And so I went on the internet. It was hard to find some like practical information. It was all theory and pontification. So it's, it's that's, this point. that's right. And, and, you know, part of that I don't think is the fault of the authors or, or, or the people that, are, that were discussing the issue. This is very fresh. It's July. Also, the opinion, you know, and we'll, we'll get to this is really vague. I mean, in all of the important ways, the opinion is vague because I've told you something that's not vague at all. I've told you so far about this opinion, it invalidated Privacy Shield. It's very easy to understand. It invalidated it with immediate effect. That's even easier to, easier to understand, right? It means this is no good anymore, okay? But the next question, the obvious question is, all right, well, what do we do about that? What mechanism, how do we get data from the EU to the United States? And that is where the opinion becomes vague and where we don't have all of the answers yet. We're going to step away from our conversation with Christian for just a couple minutes. When we come back, Christian's going to tell us how companies can get their data between the EU and U.S. without breaking the law. Hey, if you want to subscribe to Technically Legal, you can find us on most major podcast platforms. If you like us enough when you're there, I hope you give us a favorable review. Also, for every episode of Technically Legal, there's a dedicated episode page at tlpodcast.com. On that episode page, you'll find more information about our guests and links to some of the stuff we talk about. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. Okay, let's pick back up with Christian. 
Christian's about to discuss what companies can do in the post Schrems 2 world to get their data across the Atlantic over to the U.S. and how one of those ways is through the use of something called standard contractual clauses. So the standard contractual clauses are another way to get data to another jurisdiction. Now, Privacy Shield was a U.S. specific program, right? It just, that was just data going from the EU to the U.S., a specific arrangement between the Department of Commerce and the European Commission. Standard contractual clauses, there are controller to controller standard contractual clauses, there are controller to processor standard contractual clauses. Standard contractual clauses are another way to do it. And what standard contractual clauses are, are essentially in agreement, a contract between the data exporter, i.e. the EU entity, right, and the data importer, U.S., or Mexican, or, you know, Russian, or whatever, you know, other entity outside of the EU, that's the data import of the entity that's receiving the data. And it makes a lot of promises, makes a lot of, you know, there's there's a bunch of representations and warranties from both the data export and the data They're import. kind of like contract templates, am I wrong? It's more than a template. It's, it's really a document that can't be changed in, in any real meaningful and fashion. And what happens is... The data exporter and the data importer in their statement of work or contract or whatever it is, they add these. Yeah. Or at least reference to them. Yeah. They typically staple it onto the back of their existing agreement, right? Sign it. And that's their mechanism, their, their adequacy mechanism for getting the data over to the United and States. And they say things like, you're going to adhere to the rights of people subject to GDPR to, to request their data, delete it if, if necessary. You're going to adhere to the security standards set out in the GDPR. That's right. You're going to treat data subjects as third-party beneficiaries. The data subjects are going to have certain rights directly against you or against you if we, the data exporter, are no longer around. It confers, it con- so it confers rights on data subjects, and it, it addresses certain data privacy and data protection issues between the parties. And this has been around for a long time. And who came up with them? Where'd they come well, from? Well, European Commission. European Commission wrote these. So they're duplicative, though, in a lot of ways, not, all, not in all ways, but in a lot of ways, they're duplicative of Article 28 as well. So of the GDPR. Of the GDPR, which mandates how controllers and processors must relate. So it's one of these things where what happened with the standard contractual clauses is folks just started kind of, it became kind of a papering exercise, Right which is, you know, you just kind of are like, well, oh, is the data leaving the EU? Okay, well, I guess we need standard contractual clauses because we don't have privacy shield, right? And they were kind of executed in this manner, you know, just as a, almost as an afterthought. And Schrems, too, this opinion that came down just, you know, last month, right, is really attacking that notion. And that's where I think the meat of this judgment actually lies, because Trems 2 says, yeah, you, it's fine. You can rely on the, the SECs, but there's another level. You got to do some due diligence and make sure what's happening in real life is hearing with the spirit of the SECs, i.e. the data truly is wherever it ends up, whatever country is being protected as required under the GDPR. That's right. You've got to make sure that everybody's living up to this, that this isn't, you know, just a piece of paper. And depending on the jurisdiction... You may be required to do more. You may be required to add additional safeguards. That's what the opinion says. And when you say, well, what additional safeguards? Natural next question, right? Yeah, no, I I was going to ask it. I was going to ask, what does that mean? Well, they don't say. Yeah. Right? So what's a company to do? What does that mean? Do your due diligence. What do you do? Well, so first of all, what you have to do as a controller and what you have to do as a processor or as a recipient, an, an importer, are a little bit different. But, you know, you both have the same end goal. This is the case with a lot of contracting and data privacy. Both parties want to get there. Both parties need to get there. And it's just a question of how to get there. So um, it depends, again, on your jurisdiction. The real answer is I don't know. And so I want to caveat what I'm about to say with the, you know, by just telling you that this is speculation. Right. Okay. This is where the opinion's vague. This is where I think it's problematic because it's so vague. You know, it's, you can invalidate privacy shield with immediate effect, but you have to know that that's going to affect a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of data flows. And to just say, well, you know, you need additional safeguards, you might need them, and leave it until later to determine that, you know, frankly, it forces the situation where we are in right now, which, which is to say we are speculating what additional safeguards may be necessary. Okay? So let me speculate. The chief problem that the European Court of Justice had with the United States 
they're concerned about things being overbroad. They're concerned about the absence of judicial recourse, and they're concerned about how the absence of those, the perceived absence, let's just say, of those rights squares with not only GDPR, but the European Charter on Human Rights. That's what they're concerned about. So one of the things that we are looking at internally is, well, would it make sense to require of data importers, the U.S. entities now, to have something like a law enforcement policy? And this law enforcement policy is going to say several things. It's going to say we attempt to narrow warrants and subpoenas. We, you know, we attempt to make sure that only strictly necessary data is disclosed. We endeavor to notify the data exporter, the, typically the controller, right, whenever feasible regarding this, this information. Maybe even disclose whether we've received any of these, you know, the FISA 702 or other investigations or warrants or you know, a request for information. Or- How is that different from what's built into a lot of confidentiality clauses and contracts anyways? And the, the rote clause is, hey, we're going to let you know. We're not going to turn over your data or your information. Mm-hmm. If we get a subpoena, we're going to let you know. Yeah. And we're going to fight it to the extent we can. Yeah. Well, you know, the problem is, is that frequently you can't do that. Right. The National Security Agency or the FBI shows up and they want to look at something. <laughs> they will typically require that you not disclose the fact that this has occurred. I mean, the notification obligation is also in the standard contractual clauses. The problem here is one of two different, very different regimes colliding. We have on the one hand, the legitimate requirements of our intelligence apparatus, the legitimate requirements of law enforcement, right? That's one thing. And then we have, on the other hand, two parties contracting. You can say, well, I have a contractual obligation to notify a controller when uh, somebody accesses their data, but if the NSA comes in and says, don't do that, well. <laughs> well, plus what's the recourse? I mean, yeah. you sued for breach of contract? You yeah, know, the, yeah. The, the cat's mean, out of the bag, it's, right? It's, it's a tough situation. And so there's a lot of speculation regarding, well, how, how much can standard contractual clauses do in this regard? I think that there has to be a solution for moving data from the EU to the US. And I think that that solution almost certainly is going to have to involve either a Privacy Shield 3, which, by the way, is already, it's been announced yesterday, I think it was announced yesterday, is already in negotiation, or some type of souped-up standard contractual clause arrangement that will pass muster under Schrems 2. The BCRs, binding corporate rules. Binding corporate rules. What are those? And are they an alternative to SECs? There are an alternative to SECs in the sense that you can get data from the EU to the US, at least on an intra-group level. But what are they? What are they? What are they? So binding corporate rules are essentially rules of the road that you execute as a company, right? Internally. Internally. Internal to you. Internal to you. But here's the hard part. It takes two years to get them, basically. You got to get them approved. You got to get them approved. And it's an invasive process. If you go for binding corporate rules, you are effectively opening your house right, to the supervisory authority and on their schedule. And so that is not an immediate solution to anything. You know, there were folks that went out and got binding corporate rules early on. It was a little bit of a different process early on, right? And um, they're, they're still in effect today. But it is not, uh, frankly, something that I would recommend, except under very particular circumstances. And who approves those? Uh, supervisory authorities. Which are? Which are the regulators. So there's a, one, there's a supervisory authority in, uh, in every country, and sometimes there's more than one. So the supervisory authority in England, for example, is the ICO, Information Commissioner's Office. The supervisory authority is a, the, the CNIL in France. There's one, right? I don't want CNIL stands for something French. But, there's, <laughs> but there's, um, there's one for each, basically. I don't know if it's canon or county or what. There's one for each region in Germany. Like there's multiple. So there's basically one or more than one for every country that is a participant in the EU as participant in GDPR. And they're basically the ones that regulate. They're the ones that regulate and enforce the law. We talked about the differences, but really philosophical differences between the EU as far as data protection and the United States. Yeah. The EU's definition versus the U.S. definition of the information subject to this protection is much broader, right? Yeah, it depends on the regime you're talking about, right? Let's talk about EU, GDPR. So I'm talking about GDPR is personal data is anything that might relate back to an individual, essentially. So if I see your email address. Your email address is personal information, personal data, 100%, right? The difference is that the United States does not have one data privacy regime right now. We've got a smattering, you know, like like a Pollock painting that touches certain parts of the canvas and doesn't touch others. 
right? So if you're talking about Californians, California residents, the definition under CCPA, the California Data Privacy Law, personal information is a very, very similar to personal data under GDPR, modeled after it, in fact, and intends to be just as broad. But of course, that's just California residents. And then you've got a different de definition under GLB, under the gramm leach bliley Act. You've got a different definition under HIPAA, and that HIPAA is the medical data privacy law, right? And these are like little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that fill in certain parts, apply to certain data sets, but they don't apply everywhere, right? GDPR, the idea of GDPR is, is to create a digital single market where there is one rule of law that applies to all the data in the market, all the personal data in the market. That's the goal. Right. And that's what it does. So on the one hand, you've got kind of a monolithic approach to data privacy. You know, that is very protectionist of the data subject from a policy standpoint. And on the other hand, in the United States, what you have is really a federated uh, uh, approach that doesn't you know, it's it's a mishmash. Right. It doesn't reach all of the data sets and it's it's not comprehensive. And that will probably change, though. I mean, there's going to be a federal standard at some point. Yeah, I mean, I would have bet there would have been one by now with you if you asked me two years ago, and I would have been wrong. I think that there will be a federal standard. Doesn't Schrems too? maybe expedite that process? Look, if the United States wanted to be an adequate jurisdiction for the EU, wanted to essentially say to the EU, all right, we're going to play your game. We're going to do the things that you want us to do in order to get the free flow of data to the United States, it could do that. It could copy and paste GDPR, right, and become... And, and say, okay, we're going to apply the same rules, get an adequacy decision under Article 45 of GDPR, meaning the European Commission says, yeah, you know, this is this is just acceptable. So, you, so you would say the the United States government would put language together, send it over to the EU, and they would give it this blessing. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, and a lot of countries have tried to do this. A lot of countries have tried to become adequate jurisdictions. Uh, Japan is has succeeded. An adequate in that. jurisdiction meaning. If the EU under GDPR believes in adequate jurisdiction, data transfer between these two countries are, is okay. Free flowing. It's free flowing because the policies are aligned because they're similar protections. The thing is, though, you know that GDPR is very protectionist of data, and that may not be the policy that we want to execute on. What we we we've had this opportunity for two years, we haven't done it. Right? GDPR has been around since 2018. We haven't done it. We haven't done it because it's probably not going to be the way the way that we're going to go. That's not to say that we don't have a federal privacy law. It's just to say, we're not going to have the same federal privacy law. And that's what GDPR at least seemingly is requiring right now. So from that standpoint, Schrems 2 isn't going to change very much. I think what Schrems 2 announces is something a little bit different. What, what Schrems 2 is, is about, if you want to look, for, look at it from a global perspective, is it signifies a, re, a retrenching, a pulling back from the globalization of, of data flow, Right. It's what TRIMS 2 is going to result in is that it's going to be harder to get data out of the EU without question. The only question is how much harder, right? And by making things harder to get data out of the EU, the impulse may be from other countries to say, okay, well, we're going to pull back now too. We're going to make it harder for you to take our data. We're going to make it harder for our data to leave. We're already seeing this, I would argue, with you know what President Trump is doing with respect to TikTok, WeChat, you know. This is Chinese, it's the same idea. The idea is it's our data. We want to keep it or at least keep control of it. Let me ask you that, but what does that really mean? You talk about, well, you know, country A says you can't transfer to country B. They're not protecting the information enough. Mm -hmm. But we all know in this day and age, people in country A, people in country B working for the same company are using Office 365, are using Google's products. So... It's not that clean cut. Someone in Europe can log on and grab information about an employee in America and vice versa. So what does that really mean? It's not the world that we live in right now, is it? That's why I say it's a retrenching, right? It's going to require a new way of approaching data that nobody's going to be, you can't possibly be ready for this. I mean, the lowest risk approach to this is to keep data, data where it is now. That's what does that even mean, though? Right. What does right. that even mean? That, well, that means, you know, that means have your servers in Ireland if it starts in Ireland, right? But that's who, just not feasible, right? It's, it, it's not. It's not pragmatic. It's not feasible. And there's a, there's, there's a lot about this opinion that is not pragmatic and not feasible, I would argue. You know, it's not a business-friendly decision at all. And I think we're going to see more business-unfriendly stuff from supervisory authorities who've been empowered to act under the opinion. So what this opinion, this opinion flat out says 
you know, if you're a supervisory authority and you don't like what's happening, you can just shut it off. Just tell them to stop sending it. Yeah. Right? You know, something like that is, I mean, not feasible is a, is a kind word, right? I mean, imagine something like well, that. Well, we should point out, too, philosophically, you may not agree with that. I mean, you, you may agree with, with Schrems, too. Like, hey, you know, it, and there's a lot of, lot of uh, merit in that. You know, my information is sure. private. So, sure. But it seems to me this opinion isn't realistic at some level. It is law now, so it is in, in effect in effect very real. I think that what it what it asks of businesses, certainly in the immediate invalidation of Privacy Shield, is totally unrealistic. Like to say, just turn this off immediately, and there's no safe harbor, and there's no there's no you know time frame. There's none of that. You know, there is a contracting process that happens. You and I both know this really well. You know, your contract says, hey, I, we didn't execute the standard contractual clauses because we have Privacy Shield. And we were entitled to rely on that until one day in July of 2020, and now it's gone. And tomorrow we, what, need a new contract? That takes time. Under ideal circumstances, that takes time. Now do 1,000. Now do 10,000. You know what I mean? If you're a very big processor in the United States, that's hard to do. Even if you've anticipated the need to amend all of your contracts and can do so at scale, like a, like a Google, right? right? It's a challenging process to say nothing of how difficult it will be for a small business that has been relying on Privacy Shield in the United States or a small controller that has to now go through all of their vendors in the United States and figure out, hey, are these guys on Privacy Shield or not? Now I've got to reach out. Now I've got to call my more my this, lawyer. Now I've got to spend more money. The small vendor example using right there. Any business anywhere using a SaaS application, right? There are many SaaS applications that are collecting information about a business's customers. For sure. For sure. You know, there are lots and lots and lots of ways. SaaS is a great example, right? Um, you know, like a, your classic like Salesforce, right? Or something like that. Right. There are lots and lots and lots of ways to get pers- the, that personal data is being processed in the United States. That came from Europe, you know, that came from a controller in Europe, which is what we're talking about. So this had enormously broad implications, and then it just comes down with immediate effect. And it says, by the way, you're not done as a controller when you send data over. You've got to continue to police this. It's that due diligence. You've got to do your due diligence. You've got to be an expert on the data privacy laws of every country to which you're sending your data, right? Because you've got to know whether or not you need adequate safeguards. How are you going to know that unless you know what the data privacy laws and what protections are afforded in each one of those jurisdictions. That's a lot of burden. That's a lot of burden on a controller. There's no doubt about it. I'm hopeful that the European Data Protection Board in particular is going to attempt to harmonize things. That's kind of their job. They're going to attempt to get us to a single rule or something like a single rule, you know, um, that's going to be workable going forward. But, you know, I would expect more regulation in this area, I would expect specific attention from supervisory authorities, the European regulators in this area. Okay, I'm going to preface this by saying you're not anybody's attorney that's listened to this. Or that's right. Probably, probably I probably not. should have said that at the beginning. I, of this we'll, thing. we'll cover this. Is this is not legal advice. We'll cover this. this is, yeah. None of this has been legal advice. Nah, none of it. And the, the answer to the question I'm about to ask is not legal advice. But in the short term, what do you tell your clients to do? In the short term, I think the only way to go is standard contractual clauses, and you have to really take a hard look at whether you want to anticipate what additional safeguards may be required with something like a law enforcement policy. And that's going to be a little bit more case by case. That's going to be a little bit more risk driven. But what I mean by that is get out there tomorrow and execute the standard contractual clauses, either controller to controller or controller to processor. The binding corporate rules uh, are, are going to take too long, okay, and, and they're not going to be pragmatic, and they're going to come at a significant cost. And the limited derogations under Article 49, which we haven't talked about, and we don't need to, are limited. I mean, they're very limited. They're not going to. They're not going to work for um, every contract. Expand on those, like just 30 seconds. What are those? So, limited derogations under Article 49 are consent um, by the data subject, by right? the data subject, or necessary for performance of a contract. But they're only for in sporadic instances. They're never going to work at any level of scale. You can also just go ahead and get your contract approved by a supervisory authority. But I mean, God knows how long that's going to take. It's not like you're going to be sending all of your contracts to the regulator for approval. The only really pragmatic 
way to do this is to execute the standard contractual clauses, depending on the relationships, controller to controller, controller to processor, right? And after you've executed those, or in the course of executing those, determine whether you want to look at a law enforcement policy as an additional adequate safeguard. I would especially recommend that when you're sending data to the United States, because Schrems II was, make no mistake about it, about the United States of America. Christian, third time's a charm. Thanks Aye, for coming. I enjoy it. I, I always enjoy it. I always enjoy it. It's great to see you. Thanks, Thanks for so coming. much for having me on. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Um, and we socially distanced. We did. We're, we're, we're across the ping pong table right might, now, so that's pretty far. It is. <laughs> a regulation ping pong table. It's a regulation ping pong table. A nice one. Thanks the nicest to, garage I've ever been in, buddy. Thanks yeah. to Chris Craig for allowing us the use of his garage. But if people want to get a hold of you, how do they find you? People want to get a hold of me. They can reach me at 312-952-5774. That's the number to reach me at these days since we're not in the office very frequently. Or christian.audi at bclplaw.com. So that's all we have for today. I appreciate you listening. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me on LinkedIn or email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms. If you like us enough, I hope you give us a favorable review. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal. Stay safe out there.